What's going on, y'all? Today, I want to talk about the experience that I had at a 10-day silent meditation retreat. Now, before we get too far into this, I got to let you know, I left at exactly the halfway mark, day 5.5, because it's technically 11 days. But nevertheless, I had a completely transformative experience. And so I want to share what my experience was like going in and during the days that I was there, what I was getting out of it, how it's impacted my life. Now, let's see, it's November. This was in July of the year of our Lord, 2024, that I did this. So how it's impacted my life a couple months later, why I believe that I left and how I could have avoided it, and other things that I wish that I would have known heading into this retreat. So first things first, what are the rules of this silent meditation retreat? Let me, where's my coffee? Oh, dear. Ah, it's right there. This is, by the way, instant coffee, which I now have because I am nostalgic for the coffee that we had at this retreat. And there's a reason why the rule around coffee is partic particularly important in my own personal story here. So that said, the rules are basically this. No speaking. No eye contact, no gesturing, no reading, no writing. All vegetarian meals. You are not supposed to eat after lunch if you are a first-time student or if you are a first-time visitor, then you get some fruit in the evening. But really, these two meals a day... You are up at 4 a.m. and you are in the meditation hall for the first sit at 4.30. Those are basically the rules. Uh, and no, no killing anything. You're supposed to abide by these precepts. No killing anything. No sexually impure thoughts or actions. And I believe that's the gist of it. So... Oh, also no intoxicants. That's what I was re referring to when I was referring to the rule about the coffee. So how did I end up person who loves to yap and listen to others yap and write and gesture and be in the world and drink coffee, which I thought was an intoxicant, but apparently is not. How does a person who loves all of this stuff end up volunteering to go to a place where it is expressly forbidden to do any of that. Seriously, it's like you are in jail. There's just no risk. And solitary confinement at that. How does a person like myself end up there? Well, I like to live what could be called a challenge-based lifestyle, where you are constantly evaluating your own performance and trajectory in a variety of areas that encompass as much of one's being as can be quantified. And you set targets for each of those areas. And in doing this, in doing one of these, I guess, broader analyses and target setting exercises that was applied to a longer time frame, like a year and a half, I realized that in the there was one category category of my life in which I thought that I had figured out or had a baseline understanding of or competency in or whatever, but that I had put no real focus into, especially relative to the focus that I had in the other areas of my life, my body, right? Got it figured out. I am between 10 and 12% body fat on a, on a DEXA scan at any given time in the year from 190 to 200 pounds. Like I got the body composition thing on lock. My relationships at the time of setting this particular goal that led me here I was in a really great spot in my marriage. I was in a really great spot, as good as of a spot as I had ever been 
with myself, with my friends, etc. And in my career, I was doing all the things that I set out to do. And so I realized, all right, well, I've got this big sort of deficiency in the realm of me and God, my relationship to God. So I was like, you know, what would be really crazy. Yeah, it'd be crazy if if this started showing up and I started doing this and this started happening and whatever. But the craziest thing, the thing that would feel the most far out would be if I were to, I were to write a book encompassing everything that I have always believed and suspected to be true, but haven't yet been exposed to terms for it or a way of codifying it or whatever. And then other stuff that I become of become aware of along the way that's added to my belief that's added to my conviction that's a part of my broader overall testimony in terms of my beliefs about god and my relationship to god etc wouldn't it be crazy if i this guy who doesn't have it all figured out were to write a book answering these questions that I have now gotten a couple of answers to that nobody could explain to me years ago when I first started looking in earnest. And if I could also further explain other concepts that I'm still grappling with and make it all make sense. So that's what I've set out to do. And In reverse engineering, you know, what would need to happen in order for this book to not just be real, but to be great, to be the way that I would like it to be. I was like, well, you know, I would do this, I would do this, I'd, this would be true, this would be true. I also would have gone to some meditation retreat. And I never really had considered them before because I was like, what about a retreat is going to level you up in meditation. Like that sounds just like a way to maybe get money or hype oneself up or something. It's not the point. Well, little did I know, but isn't that always the case? You're like, yeah, I got it all figured out. And then God is like, (laughs) so I'm going along. I'm doing my things. I'm studying. I've got this whole curriculum written out of, stuff that I know I need to go revisit or dig deeper on or that I've become familiar with and have legitimized or verified through my own experience. And like, I want to go learn more about that. See what else there is to uncover. I've got this written out curriculum and I didn't really focus too much on what meditation retreat I would go to do. Fast forward a couple months, I'm doing things. I'm talking this over with a friend and this friend mentions, why don't you go do those silent meditation retreats, those are supposed to be pretty hard. And you're the voice guy. You're the voice and tonality guy. And the singing guy. Wouldn't it be really interesting for you of all people to have to go and do this thing where rule number one is shut up. You can't even use your voice in any way. I was like, "Mm." one of those points, one of those truths that once you're hit with it, you just can't unsee it. This jogged in my memory that a short while before that I'd been talking to a friend of mine and he was like, dude, I just did this, my like fourth of these retreats where it's totally silent and it's really, really hard and you do all this stuff and it's great. It's the hardest thing ever, but it's amazing. And I was like, ah, I don't know why I just went in one ear out the other. Somehow it got categorized as this la-di-da distraction-y thing and not as the very, I don't want to say serious because, you know, I have a painting. It's a mantra, a way of living of mine that in general, it's not that serious. But that this thing that I thought was going to be some sort of all-inclusive resort yay, kind of holiday thing would actually be so incredibly profound and so difficult and so rewarding. 
little did I know that, that these two people were talking about exactly the same thing, a Vipassana retreat in the style of SN Goenka. So this friend puts this idea into my head. I'm like, eh, all right, that's pretty good. I text my other friend. I was like, hey, what's the deal with this? What do I need to know? He's like, you sign up by this time. Make sure you get it in there. It'll be good. I'm like, okay, cool. That's about all the research that I did. And part of my thinking is, okay, I actually, for as much as I'm a, an extrovert, I spend a lot of time alone. I like being alone. I can go days without seeing anybody. I really, I'm never bored. I've never been bored in my life. I guess if worse comes to worse, I can just close my eyes and daydream for, you know, 10 days, whatever. And then I'm like, yeah, okay. So they're really serious about this. These, these are the rules. Cool. And that's all I went in there with. I did a couple of Google searches, how to prepare for Vipassana retreat and a couple of the, or, or a majority of those forums, the top comments will say, just stop looking, just show up and go. So I was like, all right, cool. We're just, we're going in, we're doing a hard thing. I know no intoxicants, which means no stimulants, which is cool. Like I should probably chill on my nicotine, caffeine, sometimes Adderall habit. Anyway, all good. It's going to be great. So I clear my schedule. I get it all figured out. I go. And I get there and I see that they have instant coffee. And this immediately breaks my frame so hard. I had so much. I can be the best soldier in the world until I decide not to be. I see this instant coffee and I was like, what is this? I thought there was going to be no caffeine or anything. This is straight up provided by you guys. This is kosher. Well, lo and behold, it is. So I get to my room and I'm unpacking and I'm like, you know, if I can have caffeine, maybe I can write a little bit. I'll just, uh, I'll leave a pen. Where's one of my, yep, that was one of these. I was like, I'll leave one of these guys behind and shout out for anybody who loves Goldeneye. Uh-oh. I was like, I'll leave one of these guys behind. They could totally write on toilet paper. I go drop everything off. I come back. Oops. I also, I did genuinely forget this. I had this little journal. And oh boy, did I do a little happy dance. I could not believe it. I was like, yeah, let's go. Sick. And then I was like, well, I've already beaten off today. So like before I got here, before I took this vow uh, why not so breaking rules from the get-go that sort of sets the the frame for me leaving later now it starts your day starts at 4 a.m right so check in signed up I'm like yolo okay breaking some rules but the main thing what i think the no speaking no eye contact, nothing involving other people. I'm going to keep, I'm going to adhere to, and I'm going to meditate hard, right? Like I got one speed. I do things. So I'm following along with the schedule. So the, even this, like the, there's a big problem there, which is that I'm picking and choosing what rules I want to follow. It's like, you're getting a diluted experience when you pick and choose what rules you want to follow. I still had an amazingly transformative experience, even though I left early, even though I pick and chose which rules I wanted to follow. Imagine what awaited me if I had completely surrendered and stayed the whole time, but time enough to get there. So uh, So <clears throat> the day starts 4 a.m. Guys come around with a gong. They wake you up. You're in the meditation hall at 4.30. You meditate until 6. You have a breakfast break and then to go walk around. Until 8, you meditate 8 to 
eight to nine, and then I think they show a movie, and then or or uh, you get new instructions or no no no, it's a break. Maybe it's eight to eleven, then like eleven to one or something, and then one to eleven to four or eleven to one is lunch, and then one to five meditation, and then six thirty to seven thirty. We watch a, an instructional movie and then 7.30 or 8 or like 8 to 9 then is last meditation of the day. And then you go to bed and then you repeat it all. <clears throat> so those meditations, you're supposed to be in the hall in this group all together. And that's really all you all you are supposed to be doing. You're supposed to go to meals and you're supposed to go meditate in the hall. And that is it. I did this about 85% of my time there. There were a couple of sits in the first two days or in the first day where I was like, I need to go to my room. Like I have to get, I have to sleep a little bit. I got to take a little nap, but otherwise in the hall, sometimes I would be out walking around trying to get steps. I just be like, yeah, I, I need a little break sort of building myself up, pacing myself in. But by the by the the last few days I was in the hall the entire time. So here is the really incredible experience that I had. This amazingly profound for me in terms of its significance. There's this idea that everybody loves to talk about or to chase which is what does it mean to be present or what is present or how do you become present? Well, present is basically this. It's that your mind is solely on the one thing that is in front of you that you are doing. We are used to having a large amount of our focus on the thing in front of us, but our mind is still at least partially elsewhere. Now, if it's elsewhere, where is it going? It's either going in one of two directions, backwards or forwards. And with that backwards or forwards, it comes with a craving or a desire to avert, an aversion, to run run away from. So pretty much at all times when we are not present, which is most of the time, we are either living in the past or daydreaming about the future trying to run away from something or trying to go get something, some feeling or run away from something, some feeling. Because I didn't do any due diligence on what we do here or what everything is, all of this is totally new to me. All they said was, you know, you can't do any other styles of meditation during the thing. The meditation that I was used to is basically figuring out by some way or another how to lower my consciousness, raise my subconscious state, and more or less pray, turn my mind off, and then once it's sufficiently turned off for a while and it's gotten a few downloads or revelations or whatever, then I will ask for something, ask God for something prompt my subconscious in some way. I accomplish this usually through various types of breathing, like holotropic breath work, or visualization or focus on something, or a mantra repeated. But what they have you do in Vipassana is actually first something called Anapana, which is you do this for four days. 11 hours a day in each of those sits. All you do is you just observe the sensation of breath as it goes from the inside, as it goes, yeah, from the top of the inside of your nose down to the bottom of your lip. You don't change how you breathe at all. You just breathe in and you observe it. And that's all you do. I noticed immediately that, oh my God, do I have an out of control mind? It is going so intensely backwards, so intensely forwards, such intense craving, such intense aversion. 
for as much as I was like, boy, I really love to live on the inside of my mind and daydream. Yeah. When you're not trying to daydream and daydreaming is an escape, you like that and you can live there forever when you're zoning out of something. But when you're not supposed to be daydreaming and then you can, then you just are uncontrollably violently daydreaming about any and everything. Uh Oh, that's new. So the funny thing is you are at absolute war and just the beginning of war, by the way, with yourself, but externally you are just, You're literally just sitting with your eyes closed in a chair. Nothing externally is happening. You just keep returning to the sensation of the breath. What I noticed is that after about a day of this, the intensity, how far in either direction, back or forwards, and how much the craving or the averting was happening, started to turn down. And when I woke up on day two, two yeah i think it was when i woke up on day two the noise was totally gone i just woke up with a clear present mind and was just only focused on the thing in front of me this got to a point where right before i left when i say focused on the thing in front of me it's like i saw like a fly or something in a windowsill and i just went to go look at it and it's not just that my powers of perception had increased, like colors were more vibrant, sounds were louder, more distinguishable, etc. Or I had better hearing, I could pick up quieter sounds. It's that your attention didn't want to go anywhere else. So I wasn't expecting this thing to do anything. I was just aware of it and just being there watching this thing exist was as fascinating and as entertaining to me as my favorite episode of The Sopranos. And that's it. Then you're just in this pocket. Then you just have this awareness, this presence, where there's no other thoughts coming up in any time that your thoughts do wander. it They wander less far, and it takes much less effort to rein them back in to where you can become present. So that was really, for me, the big profound experience that I had was this shutting off of what Goenka calls in his talks that we watch, the habit pattern of the mind. And this really is the beginning of all ability to be truly present. You know, it's something that previously... I might have gotten jet skiing or getting choked out or attempting to choke someone out in jujitsu or even in particular moments of singing or performing. You just, there's no room for anything else, but that is an external way of attaining that. Wouldn't it be nice to just be able to have access to that constantly? So this shutting off of the habit pattern of the mind is really 101. Are you present? Can you be present? And it's also 101 for, I think, spiritual development. And these two things go hand in hand because you need to be fully present with yourself before you can be fully present with someone else. The depth to which you know yourself is the depth to which you can know somebody else as much as they are revealing themselves to you. And so also anybody that you're talking to, the depths to which they can reveal themselves to you are bottlenecked by the depths to which they have gone. But turning off the habit pattern of your mind requires that you go to depths with yourself. In the first day of the Goenka lectures that we watch, And this is a, by design, very secular, it's Buddhist organization and teaching. He mentions, hey, this is when you hear about old great masters going to know themselves. This is what it means to know yourself. And you're like, what? That's, that doesn't make any sense. 
I'm just sitting here in silence. Aren't we just daydreaming? No, no, no. It's what happens after the daydreaming has passed that you're able to start really knowing yourself. Because then you have attuned your sensitivity to such a degree that you feel things in your body, sensations in your body, and those sensations are connected to messages or stories or uh, narratives that you have about some event or something that you have experienced. This is, you know, for example, in EMDR, eye movement desensitization reprocessing, what all that you're doing is just looking for by sifting through the subconscious negative cognitions that you have. I'm not good enough. I don't deserve love. I'm a bad person. I'm incompetent, etc. And then you're like, now, where did you pick that up? And where else does that apply? So this end result for me of Anapana, the shutting off of the habit pattern of the mind, increased my focus, my sensitivity to this other stuff that's happening in my body and in my mind. What it also requires you to do to get there is to not react, to not react or to not give in to whatever your mind is telling you to do or to what your body is urging you to do. It is reaching a place of equanimity, non-reactivity. So you can have these cravings, you can have these aversions, but you don't act on them. And what you get when you not only, or in order to not act on them, you have to really watch their intensity rise and fall. And this again is related to the idea of observing, just observing the breath. We're not changing the breath. We'll just observe what you're thinking. Don't necessarily change what you're thinking or observe what you're feeling, etc. Because if you try to run from that thought, then you're craving to get away from it or you know, you're having some aversion or, you're, or whatever. So you just got to let things come and go. And that was another big, that was another something that was very transformative for me. In addition to the shutting off the habit pattern of the mind, I got real experience at the experiential level, as Goenka says, what it is like to not hold on to anything. To really know that all things pass. Because like I said, it's just the beginning of a war. You'll watch these thoughts and then the feelings that are associated with them. Or feelings and then thoughts associated with them come like little raindrops. And then it's like you're in the center of the storm. You're just getting poured. or You're getting dunked on. And then it'll start to fizzle out. And then it's gone. So I also got this very firsthand experience with that. And that's happened, you know, it, there's other places in your life where that happens. There's a million and one stories that you could look to for evidence of all things pass. But in this particular way, it's so, it etches into your soul in such a way and you experience it so fully that nothing else really can compare to it. And when you have those things in place, that then makes any spiritual study that you have much deeper. Because if, for example, you have that deep reliance on, or rather that deep understanding that all things must pass or all things will pass, it makes it that much easier to trust in God because you know that whatever it is that you are suffering through is going to pass. And that if you will just pay full attention to it, be fully present with it, you will extract learning. It's a good deal, painful deal, but we do things like this to get stronger 
and to have better tools for when we get tested. So those are just a couple of the, the big things that I got out of, out of the experience, the shutting off of the habit pattern of the mind, habit pattern of the mind and the experiential knowledge that everything passes. Another thing that I got out of there is that my base level of presence of calm of non reactivity is so much higher than it was before I attended. And this is one of those things where it's like, dude, how could you have ever discounted or overlooked the environment that a retreat creates? It's just like going away to summer singing camp. All everyone is doing is singing. So of course, everybody is going to get better at a more incredible rate and everybody doing it together. It's going to a rising tide lifts all ships. So when you are in this container of a hundred plus people all on this extraordinarily focused mission, it puts wind in your sails. It gives you additional momentum and those meditative hours have a compounding effect on their own, but then with other people there. So what you get out of or the level of depth that you go into hour six on day one is not the same as hour six on day four. By that time, you've gone so much deeper and so much broader and at such an increased rate because it's not linear. An hour of meditation then might be the equivalent of and this is there's no way to really pin this one down that might be worth 10 hours 25 hours of meditation on a random you know in your in your everyday setup and so that's when when i look at myself i'm like ah you you quit it's like dude you did five and a half days you got like 60 hours of meditation okay you got 50 you got at least 48 hours of like super meditation which brings me to how I came to leave, right? I was not in any pain. One of the reasons that people leave, but also that give them the most learnings, the most eye opening experiences in these retreats is the amount of pain that they are in when they are sitting. I'm in decent shape. You know, I don't just lift weights you know, and, and eat a ton of food and gain lots of muscle, you know, I can also move my body. So I have decent mobility. I was comfortable sitting four hours at a time and not moving. I wasn't in any pain. I let my frame get broken the minute that I walked in. And Ultimately, I didn't do enough due diligence on what we were doing there for me to want to stay, to really know what was going on, or even really to have this bit of knowledge. Don't trust thoughts that come into your head. Just observe them and let them go. Somehow, even by day four and five, even though I had all that, experiential knowledge. I didn't pick up on the fact that what I was heeding was just a thought. The thought that came into my mind was, dude, you can do this on your own. You got this many more days to go. Dude, just go get back in the world. You're good. Just you only get one life. Just get out of here. And I couldn't shake that thought for 24 hours. And so I convinced them to let me go. And then I got back and I tried meditating on my own, not even close to the same. And then I just spent a ton of time researching Vipassana and being sad for myself and being like, oh, dude, uh, you just wish you were right back there and you should have been. But you know, a bunch of stuff happened immediately after that where it's like, no, it was clearly planned for me to experience everything that I experienced after that when I would have been meditating and also to have 
this bitter sweetness and to do the research that inspires me to want to go back or to have a greater understanding of what it was that I learned. The irony, not lost on me. So the way that this shows up then outside of my life, even months later, is most notable in a level of emotional control that I did not have prior even though prior i might not have say acted on an emotion i would have thought that they were controlled they weren't controlled because i was not fully aware of them i couldn't fully see them how deep or how broad or how long they were going to stay for what was going on whereas now I have the experience of, and previously, when I might be subject to what they call in Vipassana, aptly called storms, two storms, I would be as a bystander suddenly caught in the storm. Whereas now I am both bystander and weatherman watching it come in. Which makes it easier to identify what might have triggered this storm to come in and, and everything else surrounding it. It makes it much easier to detach without necessarily disassociating. But really, yeah, to be it, it is it has allowed for another level of detachment in outcome while allowing for more fulfilling engagement during something, during anything. And so what that allows for in that more advanced level of emotional control is you know, it's all in the name. Insight. Vipassana means insight. And so one of the goals of Vipassana, or one of the things that they talk about is when you get to the actual Vipassana stage where you are applying that focus of the breath from the nose down to the top of your lip, you start applying that sequentially to your whole body, you will get insight that one of those feelings or something is trying to give you like that. Now I'm not in a meditative state, but because I'm able to be both bystander and newscaster and weatherman watching this things happen, that healthy amount of detachment while still being involved or invested in an experience it does allow you to do that in a bit more of an intellectual way like oh that, 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 of course, coming to a conclusion, maybe not as deep or all encompassing, but still in the right direction as you would have from that flash of insight delivered in the meditative state. So really cannot recommend Vipassana enough to anybody that truly is a before and after in my life, before I did this retreat, before I experienced all that. And afterwards, they say that it's the art of living and it really, that really is what they're teaching because it allows for you to be so much more in any moment. The depth with which you're in a moment, how sustained that visit is, the awareness that you have of feelings from the inputs that you get from those moments, because no matter how detached you are, you can't help but to take in data 
24 seven, right? That's what the subconscious is doing. It's like you lower your filters and you just start getting more and more of more richness, more everything out of every experience in life, even just the experience of sitting and breathing. You don't think that that can be unbelievably, you don't think that that could be as entertaining or as satisfying as absolutely anything else until it becomes more entertaining and satisfying than anything else. It'll really do a number on you to realize that everything that we're doing is actually not that important or profound. You could be doing just as important and profound things with your eyes closed in a hall with a hundred other people that you haven't spoken to for almost a week. It's a very interesting thing to experience. Anyway, it is my hope that this has at the very least, whetted your appetite to learn more about Vipassana or meditation. And at the very most, has given you something, well, I don't know, at, at the most, yeah, I, I hope it gets you meditating. At the most, just reach out to me and talk if this is interesting to you, because you might be weird and crazy like me. Anyway, I'm going to get out of here and probably go do a little bit of Anapana. All right, y'all. If this is helpful, get at me. Let me know. Drop a comment wherever you're seeing this or find me at Michael Hewitt, two, three on all social media platforms. I got to get out of here. Go forth and speak boldly.